Um, good morning, everybody. I was asked to do it in English, so I'll do it in English. Um, hopefully that doesn't bother you too much. Um, and it's good for me because it's being recorded and uh, I would very much like to share it with other people. The reason for that is, so uh, I'll tell you the history about this, this talk a bit first, is that um, I was, uh, I'm having another talk which is called It's a Small World After All, which I frequently do as keynotes at conferences and stuff. And then at one time, um, early this year, uh, a conference in Jakarta asked me, could you take this small subject from that talk and build a new talk out of that? So I did that, and I went to Jakarta in, in September, and I did a keynote there, um, using more or less the deck I now have. And then I came back, and I was in the metro in Amsterdam, and I was like, what, what if I could take the sort of like chapter titles from these two talks, put them together, and create a story from that, and just start writing? And um, for me, that's a very different approach than how I regularly write. I usually start with a deck and make a training out of it, and then make it into a table of contents, and then write a book. And this time I was like, I'm just going to write. Um, and I've given myself the deadline until the end of the year, which is in like two and a half weeks, to gather enough content to be able to say, okay, this is, this is really making sense. So what I did this morning is I mapped the book that I'm now writing, which now has like 23,000 words. I mapped it back onto the slide deck. So the slide deck has changed a bit this morning. And that's the story I will be telling today. So it's actually about... Um, uh, about what happens if you move on after Agile. It's not a very technical talk, uh, uh, but it's a talk about um, how I think work will evolve in our business over the next maybe five to ten years and some structures to help you get through that actually. So um, I'm going to introduce myself. I have about an hour for this. This is me. I'm Sander. Um, um, I'm basically a, a dad of three. Uh, and my girlfriend has two more. We don't live together, so it's, it's kind of a complex situation. Um, so writing code is easy for me, actually. It's much easier. Uh, I call myself a post-Agile coach because I've been doing Agile for over 20 years, and I'm sort of at a stage that I think, okay, let's move on from that. See what happens if you, if you lose the boundaries that many people actually put onto themselves by starting to do Scrum or Spotify or whatever you do. Um, so I'll talk about that a bit. Um, uh, I'm basically a programmer. I've been writing code for um, uh, 35 years. Uh, that's a fairly long time, but in my current position, I'm, uh, I'm an independent consultant, but I I'm hired by a company called 101 Ways, and I became the director there. So 101 Ways is an agile consultancy from the UK um, that does leadership roles and assessments and puts up pop-up teams of independent people, make them into teams and help clients to solve their problems. That's in a nutshell what the company does. And they wanted to come to the Netherlands, and they said, could you help us do that? And I'm like, okay, this is so far out of my comfort zone normally having CTO-like roles and agile thought leadership and stuff like that, that I thought, I, I have to do this. So I started doing that, that's uh, half a year ago, um, and I'm still the director of One on One Ways in the Netherlands. Um, this is my website, my uh, Twitter tag, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. So I'll start off with a short history of work, basically. Because um, it's, the, the interesting thing is, the way we've been organizing work in software development and in product development has been wrong for a lot of years. Uh, we all know that, by the way, because you've been in all of these projects, but it's still nice to, to see the history and to, to actually learn from that what happened. So if you look back into, let's say, the Middle Ages, um, in the Middle Ages, people were craftsmen. Ever before, everything that happened before the Middle Ages, they were craftsmen as well, right? They chiseled um, uh, from pieces of rock and wood and later bronze and et cetera, et cetera. So in the Middle Ages, we had all sorts of craftsmen. People who educated were, were educated by their dads, uh, uh, learning how to be a blacksmith, a carpenter, a woodcutter, all sorts of craftsmanship professions, right? So these people were highly skilled, but it was very small. So they could only produce what they had uh, in mind for that day. That means there was no production lines, no factories, etc., etc. That came later when population started to grow in the 18th century. So in the 18th century, People started, in the 19th century, for most, people started looking at automating stuff, right? People invented all sorts of machinery to help automate stuff. And what they figured out is that <coughs> if you have a production process and you split that up into very small pieces, very small tasks, you don't need these very highly trained individual craftsmen to actually do the work. You could actually have the work be done by very low educated people that didn't have very much skills, but could handle a single task. 
Now, that is basically how people started organizing work in, during the Industrial Revolution, right? It's, um, uh, there's a guy called Frederick Taylor. He started measuring um, the length and the duration of individual small tasks. And he started writing production processes in all sorts of workplaces to split up into very small tasks and monitor those individually and, and then hire people to do those individual tasks, low educated, so cheap. Um, and he thought, well, maybe uh, it's enough to give them a decent pay so they do a decent job. Uh, and he started optimizing those processes based on those individual tasks. Now, that is called scientific management. Um, it's very process oriented, very much production oriented. And the thing is that we've been doing that for years and years. And what happened is that if you have a bunch of low educated people doing very simple tasks, you need people to supervise that. That's how managers started to come in play, right? That's where managers come from. They monitored these individual tasks and whether people were actually doing their job, whether they were on time. All that simple stuff, that's where management came in. And then we started producing more and more goods, like cars, for instance, and then people like Henry Ford started to interfere. By the way, most people see Henry Ford as a visionary. He was, kind of, but he also said very unnice things, basically. He said, like, give me monkeys, please. Right? He didn't want highly trained, very smart people to do the work, because he said, well, every time I ask for a pair of hands, there's a brain attached to it. And he wasn't into that, basically. He needed the pair of hands to do these very simple tasks. Right? If you look at the Modern Times movie by Charles Chaplin, I, I need to put in a, um, uh, a clip from the movie, actually. That's how it worked, right? Now, what happened is that when we started to do software, so let's say after the Second World War in the 50s and 60s, early on, we started to do software. So scientific management and processes being split up, split up into small tasks was the way to do that. We didn't know any other ways of doing that. So we started to do that in software development as well. Right? So as a result, in the 70s, what happened is that people started to write very large book, books, actually, about how to do software development, splitting it up into stages and steps and very small steps and very uh, um, elaborately des described how to do it and what to do. Um, and, and people started doing that. Right? This is uh, paragraph 2.3.1 from the SDM handbook written by the Dutch company called Pandata. Um, and, and they said, well, categorize and define the data. And you just needed to be there, read it, what you do, do the job, and hand it over to the next person. That's how we started to build software in the 70s. That was all based on the scientific management principles, basically. And we soon realized that that wasn't really what you should do. Um, um, I, I, of course, we all know that software development, waterfall, linear, traditional project management, um, these fail, right, these projects. They fail miserably. Actually, this is coming out of the report from the Parliamentary Inquiry Committee. Um, they estimate that, well, basically they said we have no clue, right? This is, this is government in the Netherlands, right, saying, uh, where, where does it say? Where does it say? Moreover, there's no one who has the final say over ICT projects, which is terrible. Since no comprehensive report on the national public finances has been drawn up since 1995, this report is from 2014, basically, Nobody knows how much money the Dutch public sector is really spending on ICT. That is crap, right? Nor how much has been wasted on failed projects. A conservative estimate is based on the information, yadi yadi yadi, between 1 billion and 5 billion each year. That is incredible amount of money being spent on wasted projects. Basically due because we've been using the wrong metaphors. We've been talking about building software, construction, or factory lines, or producing, or, and software isn't like that, right? Software is different. One of the key characteristics of software is you can always change it. If you would build a house, which is a, a, a very often used metaphor for software development, if you would build a house, and you would build almost all of the house, and you would say, oh, you know what, now we want a basement underneath the house. That is a difficult change, right? If you consider software, for, on the other hand, you could say, well, okay, let's re-architect the whole thing. We can, because software has very different characteristics. That means, and that's not because, because software is stupid, it's because we can. It's just the nature of software. Meaning, those metaphors from construction, from the Industrial Revolution, all those metaphors don't really apply well to software development. And it gets even worse, right? 
it gets worse because, well, times are changing. We all know that, right? Even Nobel Prize winners know that, right? Even though he didn't come to collect it. But um, anyway, so it's Bob Dylan, by the way, for those people of you who don't know that. And um, I'll give you a small illustration. So this is Moore's law. Moore's law says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. You might say, okay, so what? This is not a linear line, right? This is Moore's law, although it's been disputed over the last most recent years, but this is going up exponentially. Right? That means we get more and more capacity of doing things, more and more computing power, more and more storage power uh, than we had ever before, right? If I would order a computer in 1954, um, Bol.com or Amazon would actually deliver it at your door like this, right? Although they didn't exist, of course, by then. See, I, I actually started, when I learned how to program, there was no internet. It didn't exist, basically. I learned how to write code from a book, right? Nobody knows these days what a book is, actually, but I, I learned programming from a book. If it wasn't in the book, I had to figure it out myself. That was nice, by the way. Um, and I learned how to program on a computer like this. This is an IBM um, uh, 5150, and it has these things. I did a guest lecture at a, a university recently. I actually had to explain what these were. <laughs> they didn't know. They had no idea, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. So it had 64K bytes of memory, right? We wrote code against that in Turbo Pascal, basically, but that's how we did this. Um, and things changed, right? And they changed more rapidly and rapidly. One of the most important changes has been this one. And it started off with Amazon. Amazon was the first, actually. In 2006, they launched EC2, right? They launched a possibility to store stuff somewhere else. And then other parties started doing that as well. Um, I was actually in Redmond when Microsoft started investigating this stuff in 2007, I think. And, they were, and, then, and then this guy came up to us and he said, well, uh, I'm doing this, running this new project of putting data centers all around the world. And we were like, why? What's the point in that? So it's 2007, right? And, and, and he says, so how much budget do you have for it? He said, well, three billion. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, they succeeded somehow. So they're doing basically the number two. Right? But what happened is it allowed us to store data somewhere else to even run our software somewhere else. So that means that the total capacity of computing power has drastically grown. That allowed people who weren't able to do stuff before to do stuff. You used to have thousands of people needed to actually to keep up your infrastructure. If you're a, a large bank, um, they have like basements full of infrastructure. And they had thousands of people working on it, actually. They still do, by the way. And, and that's an interesting model, right? So this whole cloud thing actually disrupted everything. It disrupted the way we look at software. And actually, it sort of disabled all the previous ways of working in software development projects. Um, so if you look at the time it took for technologies to reach 50 million users, this is an interesting graph, right? It took 68 years because before 50 million people have jumped on an airline. It took. 80 years before ADMs became popular, right? It took two years before Twitter reached 50 million users. Now they have like three users left, but uh, that's <laughs> about it. But, um, and look at what happening, what's happening now, right? It's Pokemon Go it takes 19 days before it reached 90, 50 million users. That is incredibly fast, right? Um, one of our clients is a company that wants to be the, um, uh, the Netflix of sports, right? So they want to grow to... 100 million users in two years' time. They have no infrastructure. Literally, no infrastructure. The only thing is the developers have MacBooks. That's it. Uh, okay, and they have internet, and, and, uh, well, not even actually, but they don't own their own infrastructure anymore. Nobody does that these days, right? It's all changing really, really fast. To give you an example of that, this is a graph of fintech startups in the Netherlands. In 2018, there are 430 of these small companies doing something in the fintech industry. What if one of these companies would succeed in building a banking system with four Node.js developers, a QA engineer, and a product owner? Could they do that? Yeah, they could. In about half a year, you can do this. Because lots of it's already there, right? It's in open source. You can get it from AWS. You can get it from Azure. You can get it from the Google Cloud. Lots of stuff's already there. You could literally build banking software in half a year. People have done it. There's a company in the UK called Monzo. They do this. There's a bank in Germany called N26. You can get a free um, debit card there, actually, if you want. If you can set up an account, it takes five minutes. They don't have offices. They're just there, right? 
Now, if you look at traditional banks like ING, is well, they say, well, okay, nice all these startups. People actually do this, right? My girlfriend's working for a company. There's one dude there who's actually building an online bank on his own. And he's almost there. It's, he spent about a year on it. It's incredible, right? So, and other parties join in as well. Like, uh, well, I see so basically Apple and Amazon are, are going to be our biggest competitors. I don't know about Apple. I think they're declining. But it's, it's Amazon for sure, right? Amazon is taking over every industry, right? Everything that's online, they'll have it or they'll build it because they have the enormous computing power. They have a huge capacity of people, right? So they will do this. They will become a bank. No doubt about it. They will be, you will be able to finance the things you buy on Amazon through Amazon. It's probably already there. I don't know, actually. I never ordered anything at Amazon. But, uh, so that's a bigger competitor. So basically, anybody can in, come into any industry these days. Right? If you look at what Uber did. You know, what, have you used Uber? I like Uber. It's, it's cool, right? If you're in a foreign city. Like I was in, where was I? In Sevilla a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I clicked the button. I said, I'm here at the airport. Pick me up. And I need to go there. Within five to seven minutes, a guy shows up, takes me to my location. I get out. That's it. The whole process. Uber is nothing more than a very well-written application on your mobile phone. That's it. That's basically the company. And they're sort of <laughs> disrupting the whole taxi industry. And for good reasons, right? Taxis are horrible, basically. So that's what's happening in every industry. Everybody can come in. Like, if you're an airline and you sell stuff on your airplanes, you want to be able to do payments as well. Companies like AirAsia, they'll just say, uh, basically, I'm not really sure if I want a, a, a bank with an airline company, but they'll build the software, they'll have it within no time, and they'll do this, right? So anybody come in can come in in every market. That means... Well, since everything is software these days, it's going to change, right? And it's going to change into the direction of everything becoming s smaller, shorter, simpler, faster. So shorter iterations, smaller teams, smaller work items, no hardware whatsoever. And it's about simplicity. It's about less is more. And this is a very good example, by the way. This is a house built by uh, Mies van der Rohe. It's, uh, he was the founder of Bauhaus. This is a very simplistic house. It's beautiful. It's, it's very elegant, but it's very straightforward. And that's where we need to go. Um, I'll give you one more example of that, and it's called the Kinefin model. Have you seen this before? This is an extremely interesting model. Um, it was written down by a guy called um, um, Dave Snowden, who is a professor at Bangor University, and he wrote this model um, while he was working for IBM. And it's a very useful model to see where you are in the world. Right? Um, he basically says, there's five zones. This one in the middle has no name, but it is the zone, actually. You can be in the obvious zone. That means if you have a problem, the solution is in the same space. We already know the solution. It's not even a good practice. or, or, or uh, 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 It's the best practice. There's only one way of dealing with this particular problem. Right? If I want to, I don't know, it's very simple stuff. Um, like, if, I, uh, if my floor is dirty, I take the vacuum cleaner from the closet and I uh, do the floor. That's the solution, right? There's, that's the best solution. There is no alternative. Okay, you could, you could take a broom, but it's less effective. Right? That's what we do. The floor is dirty, we take uh, a vacuum cleaner. This is easy, right? Everybody can do this. Leadership styles in, in these kinds of spaces, they're very easy. You can just say, okay, do this, go off and do it. It's what linear software development does best, actually. Now, you could also be in a complicated space. Now, in a complicated space, every problem, there is a number of good practices to it. Like, if you would say, okay, you know, I need to do account management in my next application, um, you could build it yourself. I wouldn't do that anymore these days, but you can get it from Amazon, you can get it from, uh, from Microsoft, from Azure, or you could have an LDAP server, or whatever you might have. There is a solution to it. There is a number of solutions. What you need to do is do rigorous analysis of what the best solution would be in this particular situation. Pick any one of them, do the analysis, build the stuff, plan it. This is basically how we've been working in software development projects for probably 50 to 60 years. Because we've always thought that we were in a complicated zone. The problem is most of us are not. As I tried to explain during the example why uh, of that the world is changing so rapidly, it basically means that changes become so fast and so regular. And so, so if, you, if, you do, if you do front-end development, right? So what's the current framework you would use for that? 
What would you do? Are you, are you into front front end development? So what are you using? Angular. Angular is well, Bootstrap always, but Angular is already gone, right? Angular is already outfashioned. I've I've built Angular frameworks uh, two years ago for a company. Cool stuff. It's gone. And then people say yes, but you need to do React. React is now. Well, it's the majority of people use React, right? But what you see happening is that people will start using Vue, right? And so Ag React become slightly less popular. Vue will take over, and in a year, year and a half time, something else will take over, right? How do you update that? How do you deal with that? Well, the only thing you can do is make everything smaller and not create a fixed plan. If you are in this zone, in a complex zone, that means, OK, we have a general direction where we want to go, or we sort of have a goal or a dot at the horizon where we want to go. And the only thing we can do, because there is no good practice yet, it needs to evolve from what we do, is the only thing you can do is experiment. Right? You figure out what works. If it works, continue in the same direction. If it doesn't work, change direction. Change the things you're doing. Now, that is basically how software development should have worked for the last 50 years, because it's been changing all along. And because it's changing faster and faster, there is no alternative anymore, right? Most of us are not in the complicated or in the obvious, so most of us will be here. That is, if you work for a company that has a vision, right? And I've been checking companies I've worked for in the most recent years about, so tell me what's your vision. If they don't have a vision, they're here, basically. They're in the chaotic zone. That means we have no clue where we want to be. The first step you need to do if you do this is figure out where you are. Right? So leadership styles actually differ very much depending on uh, the zone you're in. Right? If you are in the chaotic zone, first step is figure out where, what you want to be when you grow up. Right? If you're in the complex zone, it means allow for experimentation. Trust your teams. Uh, make them autonomous, self-organizing, so they can experiment. Uh, make sure that there's a safe environment where if something fails, it's okay. Right? Where not everything has to be right the first time, because we cannot do that in this industry, and in a lot of industries, actually. So most of us are here. That means um, having big plans, waterfall-style linear plans, nope, doesn't work. Or creating this very detailed planning of everything you should do in your project, sorry, doesn't work. Even stuff like enterprise agile transformations. If you're in a thing like this, kill it, because these enterprise agile transformations, wherever you go, this is a picture safe, but there's more types of it. What it will usually do, it makes things bigger. Bigger means we get slower. Slower means we cannot adopt the speed we need to have to compete with others. So there's good practices in most of these large agile frameworks, but, uh, well, they're not even agile, but they're just, they're just enterprise, basically. Uh, um, uh, but if you start implementing all of this, you're going in the wrong direction because you need to get smaller, shorter. That means if you are in a chaotic or in a complex zone, which most of you are basically in, you have no plans. You need to set a roadmap. Now, I'm going to drink some coffee. Now, if you do that, the first thing you need to do is to figure out where you want to go as a company, as an organization, maybe even as a team. Now. I've been investigating that a little bit. So I worked for a company that wanted to be um, the platform for the whole insurance industry. They didn't become that, actually, but that was their desire. Right? So you have a very clear dot at the horizon. And you can focus everything you do into that direction. You can channel stuff. right? Um, to give you another example, is I was doing a training course in Belgium two weeks ago. And I asked that company, they, were, uh, they make chips. I said, what are they for? They said, they're in your car, basically. They measure everything and they censor everything and stuff like that. I didn't understand what it was doing. But I said, so what, what is your goal? And, and they said, well, our original goal was to have at least one of our chips in every car on the planet. It's kind of ambitious, right? And it's a goal. It's not a target. It's a goal. I said, so where are you now? He said, well, we have 17 in every car in the world. So I said, when I drive off the parking lot here, all of your chips are started working, right? I say, yeah, basically that's it. So we're quite happy. Um, if I look at uh, 101 Ways, to give an example, this is the management team of 101 Ways. You can see it's an agile company because they have beards and black t-shirts. Um, and, um, um, and, and they say, well, we want to become the most sought-after consultancy in Europe. 
that is quite ambitious too, right? And they say, well, it's a goal, right? We're just moving in that direction. We don't know how to get there, but we'll take steps. We'll start in the Netherlands. If that works, and we're finding, well, it's not as easy as we thought it was, but if it starts working, we'll go to Germany and take the next step, see where it goes. And then in three to five years' time, we hope to be somewhere here. Will it succeed? We don't know. But that's the vision, right? That's the goal you aim for. And this is just an example, right? It's not a commercial slide. Well, it is a bit, but anyway. So, um, um, and, and then um, at my, one of my previous clients, um, uh, a consultant came in, a very expensive consultant, of course, and he came along with the golden circle. You know the golden circle? Check out the video. It's, it's interesting, but not more than that, right? It's not, uh, don't take this as your highest philosophy in life. Um, it doesn't mean I don't agree with most things he says. I do, but this is slightly a bit of marketing mumbo-jumbo. Still, the idea is good, right? He says, you need to figure out why, what you do. Why do you exist? What do you want to be when you grow up? And if you figure that out, you can attach to, so how are you going to get there? And if you translate that to my world, it means you have to figure out which projects you're going, products you're going to build. So projects are already out the door, right? I forgot to say that, but there's no project anymore in IT. You have to do products or services. Um, and they should align to the goal you're trying to reach, right? Um, and and, and if, if you find that out, you can say, okay, so what is it we need to produce to get there? What features, what um, uh, chapters, or whatever you call it, do we need to create to do that? And that brought me back to a model that I've been using for a very long time. It's a model by Alistair Coburn, coming from a book called Writing Effective Use Cases. But I mapped it to uh, where we are now, right? And if you map Simon Sinek's model, the why, how, what, you could say, okay, we need to find a purpose. Um, then we need to create products that align to that purpose, to that goal. And, and, and those products have features. And that is everything we need to do, is add new features continuously, or change features, or remove features, or solve bugs, which are also sort of features, basically, um, and, and go from there. That's the model. And then I started figuring out, if you do that, how can you do that? Um, and then I came at a company that said, okay, we have a very bad functioning agile uh, set of teams, um, and, and they're bad at what they do. They weren't actually, but um, the whole problem was is that ideas to what they were doing came in from all sorts of directions. Basically, the CEO smashed the backlog every time he came into the building, right? He was like, oh, I went to see this client, and we now need to build this into whatever they had, right? And it changed the backlog continuously. So there was no... Um, well, uh, um, it, there was no continuous flow. It was just tick, 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 go everywhere. And people came in with all sorts of ideas and they put them on, right? And then I said, well, let's, let's try to channel that a little bit. And then I said, well, consider the things coming in as different sizes of balls. So it's not an estimation technique, by the way, because I don't like estimation, but I'll explain. So if your ideas are kind of big, they're like basketball sized, maybe skippy ball sized or football sized, they're basically too big. Because what you want to do is to be able to map those to features that you could put into the backlogs of the product teams and let them build those features. And let them own the backlog, right? Um, uh, that means you have to split it up to, oh, oh, basically all features need to be well, on the same level of granularity here, right? That means if ideas are too big, you need to split them up. And you need to split them up, and that's something I've been doing a long time already, into something which I call Autopop. Well, I didn't figure this out, but, it's, but this acronym has been around for quite a long time. It basically says, if something happens at one point in time, handled by one person in one place, it's called Odopop. Now, for the last 20 years, probably, I've been working with the Odopop acronym to figure out what the right size is for features. This is a tough question. A lot of people in a lot of organizations struggle with this big time. Now, using this very simple acronym, you can actually get there. And then I said, let's create a product board. So a bunch of people deciding what to do. Now the interesting thing there was that it matched quite closely the process I had in mind for that, the recipe I had in mind for that, to something which is called getting things done. You heard of that? It basically saved my life. I had a big burnout in 20, uh, 2008, I think. Um, I was doing too much stuff, and a lot of stuff came into my head. It blew up. 
I had a horrible relationship. Well, it wasn't horrible, it was terrible, but uh, anyway, so, um, um, and I was building a big house, uh, which is, um, well, very stressful, and I had a very busy job at Gemini. I did way too much, and at one point in time, my body just didn't want to deal with it anymore. I couldn't get up from that, literally. Um, and then it took me about 10 months to get back. And when I got back, a friend of mine, Robert, he said, well, you have to look at this particular picture. Yeah? You don't have to read the book. It's a book by David Allen called Getting Things Done. It's a horrible book. It's, it's, it's a bad read. But this thing changed my life, basically. And the funny thing is, it met quite well to what I wanted to do with these product boards. Because the basic goal of getting, getting things done is getting stuff out of your head. So everything that comes into your head, from whatever, right? Because I'm telling it now, you, you now will think, oh, I need to remember this, right? So it's stuck in your head already. Or something you read, something you see on the television, something you come up with when you're in the shower, um, something comes into your email, on your phone, on Twitter, on WhatsApp, on fa whatever, right? So there's lots of things that come into your head. And you need to clear that, because otherwise your head will explode, basically. That's the idea. And the same goes for if you're building products in a company. So everything comes in, basically the basketballs, the tennis balls, the footballs. You need to figure out what to do. Now, what you need to do in the product board is say, okay, we need to categorize it. So first of all, we need to figure out if it is something useful. If it isn't, throw it away, right? That means that's the least amount of effort you can spend in, in getting things out of your backlog, out of your site, because it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't adhere to the goal you're trying to achieve, right? So kill it. Put it in the trash. Or you could say, it's interesting, but not for now. Maybe in a year's time. Who knows? In that case, you'll save it and you put it onto the someday maybe category. You can do exactly the same with the features, right? You could say, this might become an interesting feature in time. Um, I don't know, voice activation on whatever you might have. Um, well, it's probably interesting. We should look into it eventually, right? You put it on the someday maybe category. And the someday maybe category, you revisit that by... I don't know, once every three months, you can decide on the cycle time, right? And you look at the, the, the someday maybe list again, and you think like, ah, we still not, don't need to look into it. Keep it there. If you're saying, okay, this is stale. Um, we should have done it, but it's not valid anymore. Like uh, I always do, like um, if I want to go to a concert, but I'm sure, not sure of, I'll put it in the someday maybe category, and I look at it every month, and I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, this concert has already been. Shh, throw it away. I don't need to buy tickets for it anymore, right? Stuff like that. It's really simple. Now, if it doesn't go to any of these categories, um, it's probably actionable, meaning you want to do something with it. Now, there's different categories. Like, if it's a bug or something you need to recover from immediately, like, pfft, I don't know what, somebody broke into your data center or whatever, could be, some breach or whatever you could have, you need to do it right away. Getting things done says, if you can do it in two minutes, do it. I usually do that. If somebody says, could you send me the slide? I can say, okay, plop, plop, done. I don't need to think about it, but it's out of my head when I do it. And it's the same with things that are really, really, really urgent, usually bugs. So they pass by everything. You just put them on the list of the teams who need to do it, done. Um, and the rest of it is, is interesting stuff. Because first of all, you need to figure out to which product, and of course, um, he talks about projects, but I talk about products. Which product does this feature belong to? Put it on that list, right? Label it, okay, it's that product. It's going to be in the My Account chapter. It's going to be in the Contact Us chapter. It's going to be on the customer component, whatever, right? Something that you can categorize it with. And then the question is, um, do we need to do it now? Is this the most important thing we can spend our time on? Or is it something we can plan later on? Now, that's the point where you say, we'll drop it onto the backlog of the people who need to do it. So basically, the product teams. So this gives you a structure of dealing with everything that comes in. A lot of companies that I work with, I've put up such a product board. For instance, the most recent company uh, I've did this with, the, in the product board was the CTO, which was me, head of software development, um, um, the strategic director, and the product manager. Right? The four of us decided on everything that came in. And everybody, literally everybody could put stuff in our product board, and we would deal with it. And we came together every week and decided on all these items. That's all we did. We didn't discuss them for very long. Just said, interesting, no, throw it away. Interesting, yeah, we'll put it into the CRM product. Done. That's basically it. If it's too big, that's the last thing I needed to tell. If it's too big, it needs to be split up. That is, you can't see this in this picture, but getting things done has a step for that too. Right? So 
You split it up if it's size basketball, if it's too big, if it's too vague, if it cannot be built, if it cannot be pushed into the pipeline of a particular product, um, then you need to split it up into ping pong balls. That's basically it. So what's the next step? Now, if you do this, um, there's, there's a warning I have to take, is that if you look at Agile, a lot of people will look at Agile and say, oh, yeah, this is Agile, right? Which, by the way, is the title of my most recent book. But um, um, this is basically Scrum in a nutshell, right? Um, now, a lot of people have implemented Scrum. The problem with implementing something is, is it's a one-off. It's you implement it and you keep on working like that. And I've seen that at a lot of companies, uh, especially since I've been doing Agile for uh, over 20 years now. I started doing that in the late 90s, actually, and uh, even before it was called Agile, by the way. But um, uh, what you look at at Scrum is people will retrospect continuously, right? That's what you do in Scrum. Every iteration, every sprint, you do a retrospective, you try to improve on what you do. The problem with that model is that people will do that, but they will do it within the boundaries of Scrum or within the boundaries of any of the frameworks you might use, right? And, and the problem with it is, let's say if that framework has inefficiencies in it, if there's stuff you could do better, but you need to step out of that framework, people don't do that because they don't see it. What? Yep, you could, yeah, you could say it like this, yeah. Well, I need to put the word holistic in my book somewhere. It has to be in there, right? It's like, no, yeah, right, but it's people, so if I say, okay, um, I got to this company, they said, oh yeah, we're going to do refinement sessions today. With the whole team, like 15 people in a room, spent the whole day on refinement sessions. A lot of companies do that, actually. It's not a very efficient way of doing that. And so I said to them, so why are you doing it? Couldn't you do it more efficiently? And yeah, we can. Um, I said, oh, well, you have to do it, right? So I said, well, who's telling you that? He said, our manager. We have to do refinement sessions. And they got together, 15 people in a room the whole day in a two-week sprint. That's a lot of waste, basically. Right? I said, well, stop doing that. We're going to do it differently. They said, no, you cannot, because this is the way you do it in Scrum. Right? It's, it's that um, mindset that um, um, stops us from moving beyond what is called Agile and what is called Scrum. And we need to move beyond that, because everything needs to be smaller, shorter, faster. Right? So um, if you scale up, um, like, oh, yeah, we want to scale up, so we're going to do Scrum everywhere. I don't like that, actually. I don't like to push people into using any framework whatsoever, right? I think um, if a part of the organization is in a different uh, context, like if you are, like if you are in an application management department, right? You could probably well be in um, um, uh, uh, in, in the uh, obvious zone. You could be in the obvious context, right? That means agile might not be might not work there, because so if all of these agile evangelists that who start pushing agile into the rest of the organization. I think, think you should always take a step back and see if the other rest of your organization actually wants that. And if not, find a way to communicate with different ways of working, right? So anyway, let's move on, because I have a lot of ground to cover, actually. So all of these Agile frameworks, there's nice patterns in it, but it doesn't mean if you adopt it that you become more Agile. Uh, like this is holacracy. Look, uh, there you go with your holistic view. Uh, and you have sociocracy, which has a lot of patterns in there. And people will start implementing all of them. It isn't meant to do that, but you can do it, right? Or, again, it's the Spotify model, right? Everybody's trying to implement the Spotify model, which is basically wrong for a number of reasons. First of all, well, you're not Spotify. Spotify is a rapidly growing organization that needs to structure everything they do. They need it, by the way. They don't do that anymore, right? So, second of all, the Spotify model doesn't really exist, right? It is actually a white paper written down by a guy called Henrik Knieberg, who works for Spotify, at some point in time. It's a snapshot. It was their way of working at that point in time. They moved on from that the day after. They are using very different ways of doing things. They used to still use the same terminology, but it works very differently now. So if you're as a company saying, oh, we're going to implement Spotify, you're actually implementing um, a way of working from a company that is very different than your company is, um, and it was their vision on how they worked four years ago. Figure that out, right? So the problem is with that, well, the idea is you need to find your own way of doing this. And you need to think, of, you'll be able to think outside of the borders of what Agile proposes or especially what Scrum proposes. Because Scrum becomes sort of like a mantra in most organizations. And you need to move beyond that, actually. 
Um, actually, you need to talk about autonomy. These are my sons. Um, they're horrible. Well, they're, they're sweet, but they're also horrible, right? They want to make up their own, own mind all the time, right? So this is my, uh, my oldest son. And he started at university in September. And he took a year off before to figure out what he wanted to do. So he started off a study in September. He came to me on the 1st of October. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. I said, okay, dude, what do you want to do? He said, I want to become a professional drummer. So he's now studying to get admitted to a conservatory. That's his thing, right? I cannot say you have to go to university. Why would I? It's his autonomy. I spent 10 years convincing my daughter, who's even older than he is, to that Microsoft Word can actually generate a table of contents for you. It took me 10 years to convince her of that. And now she came back recently to me and said, Dad, did you know that Microsoft Word can actually generate a table of contents for you automatically? I said, no. Really? I tried to tell you that for 10 years. She said, yeah, why didn't you tell me before? I said, I did. Well, that's autonomy, right? Autonomy is very hard to pick up. Is she using tabs or spaces? Yeah, yeah, yeah no, she's not a programmer, actually. <laughs> so, so the thing is, again, at work, if you are in a complex context, that means you have to allow for experimentation. Experimentation works best if you have autonomous teams. This is a picture at the zone uh, in Amsterdam, and they're talking to an architect, and the architect's from the center team, and at this point in time, he says, well, we have a very limited set of rules, and the rest of it, figure it out yourself. What technology to use, what frameworks to use, how to use them. It's your, it's your team, right? It's your product. Figure it out yourselves. And that's a very interesting idea. Some companies go beyond what is good. <laughs> um, this is at Zappos in the US. I wouldn't want to work in a workplace like this. It, it's sort of like, this is too much, right? A lot of companies do that. It becomes too much. I wouldn't want to work here. Most developers I know cannot work here. It's too distracting, basically. Well, look at this picture. This is not in the IKEA. This is at a very well-respected retailer in the Netherlands which I order uh, quite a few things at every year. This is my girlfriend's leg. She's in an interview for a very senior IT management job at this particular retailer. She's in a glass room, up to her knees, filled in little bowls. Right? This is taking it too far. This is actually not taking autonomy serious. This is just sort of mandatory fun. It's not the way it works. Because the problem with um, uh, autonomy and experimentation is that it's usually out of your comfort zone. That's why I took the job I'm in now. Right? I wanted to see what happens outside of my comfort zone. So I'm now in a job that is totally outside of my comfort zone. I have no clue how to do it. Uh, sorry, people at 101, I really don't. So uh, anyway, <laughs> no, they know I don't. So um, and I said, well, let's do this, right? Because that is where things happen. You don't expect them to happen, which is really cool. And the problem with autonomy is you can't teach people how to be autonomous. It's like this. It's like if you want to teach how to uh, uh, learn how to draw an owl, it's basically, I can tell you why, you start with two circles and the rest of it, well, just figure it out, right? That's the way it works. But I did figure out one thing over time, and that's this thing, is that having less rules works. Right? This is um, Alexander Plein in Amsterdam. Uh, they removed all of the uh, street signs, the street lights, the, uh, uh, the shark teeth. Everything's gone now, and people need to figure it out themselves. I'll show you a movie clip that I shot in a car in, uh, on Sumatra two months ago. So I went to, um, um, to Indonesia to do a conference, and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to other islands as well, so I spent some time on Sumatra. This is in Medan, it's a huge city. Look at all the signs they have on the road, right? They're everywhere. They're not. They're basically, they're, there's no road signs there. Nobody, well, everybody just figures it out. Even the stop sign is on red and green at the same time. I have no clue what that means, actually. <laughs> And we're just getting there. You know what happens, of course, it doesn't always go right, but what happens here is an interesting pattern is if there's nothing there, it's scary, by the way, but it's, if there's nothing there, you just have to communicate. Right? You have to start thinking. And the thing we do with all our pre-described processes and stuff we do is, I'll show you actually the crossroads uh, in my local town, um, which is... It has a lot of stripes and a lot of things in there and a lot of stop signs and lights and whatever. And uh, people stop thinking. In the Netherlands, it's actually more dangerous to go through a green light than to go through a red light. Because if you go through a red light, you're at least paying attention to what you do. It's actually true. Which is weird, right? We have too many rules. Um, and that's bad. So we need to move into what I call micro teams um, and collectives, by the way, which is a phrase I, I started using later on. I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you what problems we try to solve. 
So there's, this is about seven. First of all, especially here in the Netherlands, nine to five does not work, right? Um, if I go to Amsterdam, I went to Amsterdam yesterday, I got stuck in traffic on the A2, which is one of the biggest highways we have in the country, right? I got stuck, I was standing there on the road, standing still, looking to the other side, it was the same pattern. People were standing still on the other side, and I was like, what are we doing here? Why do we all need to start at nine o'clock at work? What's the point in that? If we could spread it out, it would be much better, actually. And we could, right? I could just say, I'm going to stay at home, read my email first, and then go to wherever I need to go. It would save a lot of energy in the Netherlands, actually, and in a lot of countries. So that's a big problem, right? So we spend a lot of time in traffic. Like, in the Netherlands, it's costing like um, three and a half billion euros every year, people just standing in traffic. It's horrible. It took me two hours to get from Utrecht to Amsterdam yesterday. Two hours of a distance of 40 kilometers, right? It's just incredible. And it's, in, in other countries, it's quite similar. So we need to find ways around that, actually. Also, a programmer's mind doesn't work like that from 9 to 5, right? If you look at uh, what Edgar, uh, Edgar Dijkstra says about it, he says, the programmer has to be able to think in terms of conceptual hierarchies that are much deeper than a single mind ever needed to face before. He's basically saying software development is the hardest job in the world, which it is, by the way, because it's... Um, you cannot oversee it anymore. It gets too complicated. As a result, and by the way, we think, because it's creative work, um, saying, oh, we work from 9 to 5, this is how managers look at it, right? You get in, you do work, you get to lunch, you do more work, you get out, bye, and I see you next day. My mind doesn't work like that. I get my ideas in the shower, in my car, on the train, wherever I am at any point in time, and I need to be able to work on that. So we need to look at work much more, well, holistically maybe, that maybe that's why I'm going to put in the word holistic. Uh, and, and look at it like we have to be able to work at any point in time. That also means you have to get a lot of trust from the organization you work for to say, okay, do it whenever you want it to do, as long as it's done, right? You manage the outcome, not the output. You don't manage that somebody works eight hours a day. You manage that they build the feature you need to build. That is a very different way of looking at organizations. Also, there is a low availability of resources. I hate that word, by the way. If I, I, I always correct people saying, yeah, yeah, we need more resources. And I, what, what do you mean? You need more tables or chairs or do you need more people? Because in that case, I prefer to say people. Um, and the problem is, there's not enough of us. In IT, I looked at this report this morning. It's from the UFA. And they say, um, so software and product development is everywhere. It's not just in IT. Most companies I see, most organizations I see, are actually becoming IT companies. A bank has nothing to do with money anymore. They don't see any money anymore. It doesn't exist. They're a software company. Tesla, for instance, that seems to build cars, they're basically a software company. If you go to their workplaces, there's more software developers than engineers. They largely build software in a very, uh, uh, in a very reliable way, of course. Um, and, and the shortage in IT is growing and growing and growing and growing. If I look at my current teams in Amsterdam, there's only, out of the 16 people I now have, there's only five of them coming from the Netherlands. The rest of them is coming from all over the world, right? We are not able to find the right people anymore. That's everywhere in the country, by the way. And that's everywhere. Um, so we need to do look at it differently. We are becoming like T-shaped professionals. There's one thing you're really good in, and you're okay in a lot of other things, right? You're a, uh, you're a cloud engineer, an AWS engineer, a React developer, an Angular developer, a Node.js backend developer, a Java backend developer, maybe a C-sharp backend developer, a UI specialist, a UX, an architect, whatever you could be. That's your specialization, and you know a lot of other things. And with that, you could say, well, we're going to move to what I call gig workers. People who come in for a specific reason into a team to help them with some speciality. If we don't have any experience in AWS, we need to get it. And we need to get it for a certain time until we've done everything we need to do with it, and then people need to flow out again. If you have people on the payroll, that means you have to retrain them again and again and again. That could be an okay model, right? Because having people on the payroll usually creates a relationship, a long-lasting relationship, which is okay. But for most of the skills we need in software development, you might as well pull them together at any point that you need them. If you want to change the UI framework you're working with, you need different people often. 
or you could retrain them, which is much more expensive. So you need to make a choice there, right? You could say, okay, I'm going to hire independents for a large part because they bring in the specialities we need, the skill sets we need, and then they'll just go out again when we're done with it. So I, I can see that this is growing, actually. Also, well, you know that, right? Communication is hard, right? Uh, especially for so most software developers who are slightly autistic. Um, I am, so most of us are. Um, communication is tough, right? And the more people you get communicating, so if you're in a stand-up in the morning with 15 people, it's a lot harder than if you have only two people. So you could say, why not try to create teams that are even much smaller? So I like the six plus or minus three uh, people in a team idea that Scrum has. It doesn't fit software development anymore, actually. Because we need so many skills that it's very hard to get that into a group of six people or even three people. So you need to split that up a bit. So I think we are over-communicating. In most of the Agile projects I see, there's so many meetings. You could be in meetings all day without having to write any code at all, right? This is just coming from one of my previous clients. This is everything they did within a two-week period, like backlog grooming. I hate that, by the way. Demos, retrospectives, lots of management meetings, daily stand-ups for every team. And if you're in multiple teams, you can spend a lot of time on that, basically. Do more refinement sessions. Um, they had release focus periods, which is very, very bad phrasing because it's called R RFP, which is very different. Uh, open floor plans don't always work, right? It creates a lot of noise, a lot of buzz going on. Not everybody is okay with that. So people start wearing noise cancellation headphones. They're very good. I have them too. Um, so it's a lot of communication. And then came my girlfriend, who's in the picture on the right here, cutting meat. As we were in Poland, I guess, to do this. Uh, and, uh, and she said, well, we don't need even more collaboration. We need better collaboration. We need to figure out ways to do that in a better way without having to have even more meetings because we get stuck with all these meetings. So that's another problem we need to solve. And then, um, as you all know, we suck at estimation. right? Estimation in software development is just terrible. Um, and, um, well, I'm going to say you stop doing it. At low level, beyond Odapop, which I mentioned before, beyond the feature level, there is no need to do it. And you can say, yes, but I need to know how much work goes into a sprint. Well, not if you don't have sprints. Right? If you don't have sprints, you don't have that need. So you don't have the need to get this meticulous, detailed uh, estimation anymore. And uh, it's an interesting thing to look at the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers says, um, oh, let me use that pointer. I want to use it sometime. See? Uh, it's a theorem that describes the result of performing the same experiment a large number of times, and according to the law, the average of the results obtained from a large number of trials should be close to the expected value. That means if you throw a dice a hundred times, what will be the average? Three and a half, right? So if you estimate work items or stories, whatever you do, on a scale from one to five, and you have a hundred of these items, what do you think they'll be on average? Three. One to five, so it's three, right? So that doesn't add value. And people say, yeah, we do that to get a better understanding of the work item. Yes, with a whole bunch of people, of which most of them are never going to build that particular item. So you might as well not do this. So you should stop, basically, doing these low-level estimates. They're not necessary. They're just waste, basically. You could stop, right? It's an idea. Um, and, and then, so people did research on comparing story point estimation to just counting items. Story points estimation at a low level actually to, to get the idea of how much work goes into a sprint doesn't really work. I'll, I'm going way over time. We have lunch after this, right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> so hopefully the croquette will be warm when we get out. So anyway, so, uh, so stop doing that. doesn't add value. And the next thing, and that's basically one of the last problems, is red sprints. People do this, right? So they go into a sprint, try to estimate the amount of work that you have in a sprint, and try to finish off that work. That is typically how Scrum Project works. They don't work like that, right? Every time, every sprint, there's work left. One of the reasons is that we're bad at estimation, even low level, especially low level. Um, uh, but also, stuff happens, right, during a sprint. That means you never get the work done. This is coming from a project in Belgium. Look at the six sprints I put up here, right? There's a lot of work left at the end of every sprint. And it didn't change that pattern. And the manager got really angry because you suck at what you do. You're bad at software development. You're bad at estimation. And I said, well, there's one thing you could do. is that If you look at the Agile Manifesto, the Agile Manifesto says to satisfy this customer, 
through early and continuous delivery of, um, uh, of valuable software. Right? Continuous does not mean create two-week projects every time again and again and again. It means continuously deliver software. So if you would go to a pattern of which in which you deliver software all the time, feature by feature, you would be of much better, right? You could remove the sprints from your process. You could remove low-level estimation from your process. Um, and that's where we went. So, um, and the last thing, the last problem is that software development is not as easy as it was. I started off writing Power Builder and Turbo Pascal in the 90s. That was easy, right? That was a piece of cake. If you look at current technologies, it's just too hard, right? You have people who have all sorts of skills, and they're all needed to create the software. Now, every item, if you look at every individual item on your backlog, they're all different, right? For some, you might need, I don't know, a domain expert, backend developer, typically Java, uh, an architect and a QA. Um, and for another one, you just might need an architect and a front-end developer. He looks happy here because he's not really a front-end developer. He didn't like that, but I put him in a picture anyway. So um, it's different from item to item. So it's time we looked at it like that way. And then I started thinking about the patterns I've used over the last, let's say, eight years in software development teams and projects. And I started to look at it, well, let's say, holistically. <laughs> it's stuck in my head now. Um, and I started looking at, the, at, at something which I call the collective. And I came to that idea because there is a, a big band in the Holland. Hey, where did the slide go? Where was the slide in between? Where did I put it? It's gone. Well, anyway, I started looking into collectives. And there's a, this is a big band called um, the New Cool Collective. And they have all sorts of people playing all sorts of instruments. And for different types of songs, you could use different subsets of these people playing that particular song. So if you would play a ballad, you could use a piano and a bass player and a singer. And if you would play a soul song, you, you would have the whole horns section in it, um, probably a female singer and uh, drums and stuff. So for every type of music you create, you create a subset from that whole collective. And we could do the same in software development. Now if you look at traditional linear teams, there's different roles, usually, uh, usually on different floors even in buildings. I've seen that actually. And they don't, they don't communicate. They're usually not even on the same time in the project. When we moved to Agile, we started looking into, okay, we have teams that are multidisciplinary um, and that do the work together. And they're like, I don't know, um, a six plus or minus three people in that. But as I said, software development becomes more and more multifaceted. It becomes harder to do that. So this is where basically the Big Band slide comes up. Um, it's in the wrong order, I guess. So um, again, um, you could say, if I have different setups, different sub-teams out of that collective, I could actually, oh wait, I set my timer to 55 minutes, so I still have five minutes, right? <gasps> cool. Cheer, cheer. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so you could have different setups, different subsets of this particular pattern, of this collective of people doing your, your project that could do different work items. Right? I don't need um, an AWS engineer on all my work items. Um, I need somebody who understands pipelines if I change the pipelines. But he doesn't have to be there when I do front-end development, for instance, right? So you could use different people on different work items at the same time, too. So I started looking at, like, I was like, what if I pull together all of the um, people into a group, into a collective, that together have the required skill set? And when I started looking back into how I worked with teams uh, over, the, over the last couple of years, I was actually doing that, unconsciously, actually. And I put together this whole group. Um, at my previous company, I had a team of 25 people. The one before, I was CTO for an insurance company. We put together, like, um, in the end, there were like 40 people on the collective that together could do everything we needed to do. They had all sorts of different skills, right? Uh, and they worked on that. And then, from that collective, with every work item you work on, you create a different team. And I put up the recipe. Um, I, I, where's the recipe? Um, oh, yeah. It's here. I'll put up the recipe. I just created the slide deck this morning, right? So sorry if it doesn't always flow literally. And so I created this recipe. This is actually literally coming from my new book. I says, well, okay, if you have a backlog, which basically has items of ping pong ball size that come in from your product board, that's the list of stuff you need to work on as a, as a collective, as a collective realizing a particular product. And you could say, okay, Every time somebody's done with his previous work, they pick up an item from that backlog, ping pong ball sized, right? And then when they look at the item, usually this is done during stand-up meetings, in my experience, because it's just the way it happens. Um, they pick it up and they form a small team. Like, 
um, okay, uh, we're going to have to build a web page here. And there's, a, well, maybe the UX expert says, okay, I want to join you on that particular work item. And there's a, an Angular developer says, okay, I'll build the code for that. Uh, and there's maybe a product owner says, you know what, I'll come in and help you out to see what's on the page, et cetera, et cetera. Those three people, or two or one, form that micro team. That's, I started calling it micro team because I was, I figured this out when I was doing a microservices implementation. So I pick up the word micro, which is kind of popular back then, um, and it kind of works. So um, you form that team to build that specific work item, right? You discuss that. That's basically replacing refinement sessions with the whole team. You just say, okay, with these two people or three people, we're going to sit together, and we're going to discuss what's in the work item. It's basically design. I, I used to call that design sessions before, but um, I just, just basically discuss the item. Figure it out. Put stuff on Confluence or wherever you put it, and we'll be able to build it. And then you build it. Whatever it is, right? If it's an improvement on your pipeline, if it's a bug you're going to solve, if it's scaling up, if it's putting stuff in serverless mode instead of in on-premise microservices, whatever it could be. It doesn't really matter, actually. It doesn't even have to do with software development. You could do different things, right? Um, and you just put up, put up the item, which comes, of course, again, from the product board, which sort of adheres to the goal you're trying to achieve into the stuff you're trying to do. The individual features, the ping pong balls that you're trying to realize. There's no need for estimation if you do this. Right? Also, you get rid of large, a lot of these large meetings, like refinement sessions, because it's only those two people working on it. That means they also, the two or three of them, can figure out how to work on that. If they agree to all come into the office at 11, that's their problem. Of their, it's their, I don't know, that's their way of working, right? They could do that. If they all three want to work from home, or if they work at different locations, it's up to them. But because it's a very small group working on an item, there is not that overhead in expensive uh, communication anymore. They just need to figure it out, the three of them. So they work on it. Eventually it's done when it meets the definition of done. Um, and then they go probably back to the, uh, uh, the stand-up meeting. The team disbands, and you repeat the process. You pick up the next item. Sometimes, or all the time, actually, teams shift after every work item. Right? That means somebody from a particular micro team just finished something, and they look at the backlog and say, OK, well, I want to do this one. Maybe because they want to learn something new. Maybe because it's just their speciality, their vertical slice in the T-shaped uh, uh, profile. Um, and somebody else might say, oh, no, well, you know, I'll join you. I'm done with the work on this particular item, so I'll join you. And different teams form again and again and again and again. And the interesting thing about it is, you don't have to tell the people how to do that. They'll do it automatically. And I've seen this happen, actually. I've seen this in reality, uh, in, in progress. So stuff like this happens, right? It's like, here there's um, an infrastructure guy and a developer sitting together. Um, interesting thing is they both left the company where this picture was taken in the meantime. Um, or here it's um, two developers and a QA engineer working on an item. Or here it's an architect and a developer working on an item. The setup for every item could be different. And it changes all the time, dynamically or organically or holistically. Um, that's probably a good word. And, and then if you look at leadership, so um, you don't need extensive leadership, right? This is actually, you can do this on a very autonomous basis. As long as you keep the collective sort of stable. Don't change the collective all the time, because every time you change the collective, the dynamics of the whole team change a bit. And you want to try to avoid that. Uh, but these micro teams change all the time. Again, here, this is two developers working on an item. They're working on some, I don't know, they have a Jenkins pipeline up here. Um, and that means for every work item, they own their own work. So leadership becomes totally contextual to what they're doing. And the interesting question I always get is like, yeah, but how do you keep up the larger, um, the larger overview of what you're doing? Now, that is what the product board is for, right? So if you combine the collective and micro teams and a collective implements a particular product, and you have a product board judging everything, you've got a very, very simple, straightforward process to do product development, actually. So doing this, implementing this, actually helps a lot. Um, I don't have to think about utilization anymore. Like, oh, did they work for 40 hours? It doesn't really matter, as long as they do the work they do. If you still want to measure stuff, the only thing you need to measure, I should have put up a slide of that, is cycle times. It's the time it takes from when an item gets to the backlog until it's in production. That is the one thing you need to measure. The most important thing. There's more, but that's the most important thing, right? If that shortens, you're actually better at getting better. 
So if you talk about improvement, it's about shortening the cycle times of your, of your teams, right? And you need to facilitate them to do that. But that's all. And the rest of them, they do it themselves, right? Um, you don't have to do micromanagement anymore. You can lose the sprints. You can lose the low-level estimates, basically. So it, it's becoming a very organic, holistically culture of product boards, collectives, and micro teams. And it works. I've seen it work. That doesn't mean it works for everybody, because as I said, you have to find your own way in doing stuff, right? So some of this stuff might work for you, some of it might not. And that's okay, of course. You don't have to follow somebody, right? It's just like Life of Brian. I watched Life of Brian with my 13-year-old earlier this week. He had never seen it before. And there's this scene in it where he says, go away, you're all individuals. And then everybody shouts, we're all individuals. And then somebody says, well, I'm not. But anyway, so it's, it, it's that, right? Don't, you don't have to follow any pattern or any framework. Just figure it out yourself. That's the basically thing to do. Um, uh, but this is a, a pattern that might, might be applicable too. And of course, uh, it means, especially when you're in complex and chaotic contexts, don't start doing projects anymore because projects don't really work in this industry. They're the wrong metaphor. So basically, um, that's it. I went like three and a half minutes over time now, but I have some small afterthoughts. First of all, most of us are not in complicated or obvious zones, which are easier to manage because it's basically a linear process of doing some analysis, figure it out, build it, done, right? Most of us are either here or here. That means you can set the dotted horizon. Go out into your own company and ask your managers or your CEO, ask them or look at the website and figure out what the mission statement is, right? Where do they want to be? And you can create a product board that helps you get there, that channels stuff, and then build it down into different products. If you're here, first figure out where you need to be, where you want to be in three years' time, right? That's the thing. That means... Traditional ways of working, whether that's waterfall or maybe even just regular agile process, you should look beyond that and figure out especially what works for you. I've got a nice example of that, actually, to round it up. So I was in Romania earlier this year at a conference doing a keynote, and um, there was a, a booth, and they said, well, could, could you fill in this quiz? You can win a T-shirt. I always like winning T-shirts, so, um, and I asked, answered the question. They said, Nat Stark is a senior product owner. Which approach do you think he will recommend when refining the backlog? And I looked at the answers, and I'm like, well, depending on how you work, all four of them are good. It just depends, right? And I said, no, it's answer A. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, um, <laughs> good for you. But it actually is, it could be all four, depending on how you work and how you collaborate and what you think of stuff and who's responsible for what. And they're like, no, it's answer A. I still got the t-shirt, by the way, though. But, uh, um, so what I'm saying is here, um, this, of course, comes from Scrum, but don't just copy somebody's model. Do it with a reason. Also, if you retrospect, retrospect on the framework you're using itself because there might be elements in it that are not necessarily efficient in your way of working. That's basically the guess, right? And if you want to change stuff in organizations, there's only one way to do it. I speak with a lot of people, especially when I do talks like that at developer conferences. People come up to me and say, yeah, but I'm just a developer on a team. What can I do to change this thing? I can't change it. I'm just a developer. No. Every change you need and you want, you should start it yourself, right? Because it's you that ignites the change. It's not somebody else. You cannot wait for somebody else to do it. Life is just too short for this, right? So if you want change, you have to do it yourself. That's in your personal life and in your professional life too, right? And the thing is, in this industry, you'll never stop learning, right? Until you retire at the age of probably 70, when we, at the time we retire, um, or 72 or whatever, um, until that time and even later, you never stop learning. This is what I tell my kids too. They hate it. My youngest son is still in high school. So, well, you never stop learning. You're like, crap. <laughs> <laughs> But that's it, and uh, of course, this is even more important. Always try to have fun. Um, so that was uh, my talk for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it makes sense. Uh, if you have any feedback for me, you're saying, okay, I missed this from the story, or you should add this to the story, or maybe read into this stuff, I'm, I'm really eager to know. So my email address is on here. Yeah, this is the best email address to do to Sandra. This is agile.nl. Um, and, well, thank you for listening in, and um, I hope the croquette are still warm. <laughs>